So psychedelics and the future of Judaism. Um, this is a picture of me. Um, I was I was honored enough to be part of a study with Johns Hopkins University in 2017, where they had 20 clergy people um, be part of this study through the behavioral sciences uh, section of Johns Hopkins. And they gave these 20 clergy two high doses of psilocybin. That is the active ingredient in the active compound, the active psychedelic compound within um, magic mushrooms, psilocybe mushrooms. And they wanted to understand what is the nature of consciousness for uh, someone and a, a group of people who have access to a particular vocabulary and understanding of the world. They are involved in spiritual matters. They are um, guiding or counseling or serving as a pastoral role for other people with regard to religion and spirituality, um, what would happen if we gave these mind-altering, mind-enhancing, soul-enhancing uh, compounds to these people, and what might they be able to say about their inner experience that would help us understand not only what is the effect of these things um, on people in general, um, but what is the mystical quality of them? Um, so we'll talk about what mysticism is, we'll talk about what psychedelics means, we'll talk about um, a number of these technical things. Um, but this is me. This is me on the couch. This is the end of my session. Um, you can see that I have an eye mask on, I have uh, headphones on, and uh, I'm actually very comfortable on a couch. Um, and this, I also want to take the opportunity right now to say that in no way uh, through any of my writing or through my presenting today, am I advocating for the illegal um, or the illicit uh, misuse of uh, any sort of drug that is uh, federally scheduled um, as, as, a, as a drug that, that could have legal ramifications. What I'm talking about is in the context of uh, scientific research Anything that I'm talking about is after the fact, after these uh, compounds and plants become decriminalized in some cases, legalized in some cases, um, allowed for expanded access for um, healthcare, uh, and not for the purpose of people taking these substances on their own. Um, but if people are going to, then at least they have more information and that it is a, a matter of, of harm reduction. Um, but that's up to people, but not my, um, my personal advocacy um, for this work. I also want to take uh, this opportunity before I get started to dedicate my teaching and our, our evening of learning together for George Floyd. Um, his memory should be for a blessing. And thinking about all of the people who are marching for racial justice, who are marching against uh, systematic oppression and against um, against white supremacy in this country. Um, and so my teaching, my, my thoughts are with his family, um, people of color, communities of color, Jews of color, who need my support, our support, uh, more than ever tonight, um, having them in mind as well. I want to mentioned some of the terms to be used. Um, I've already used the word psychedelic a couple times, but I probably will be using the word entheogen uh, much more frequently throughout the, the conversation tonight. Um, and we'll talk about what those things are and where those terms come from. Uh, I also want to talk about what a mystical experience is, just so that you know you might have a different interpretation or a different definition, or you might have no definition, but for you to know where I am coming from with uh, the use of a word like mysticism, um, and not to have it be an assumption that we, we all know what mysticism is, we all know what psychedelics are and what they do. Um, so to have kind of that baseline. And I also wanna uh, mention what integration means with regard to uh, psychedelic research and psychedelic therapy. So just a little bit of history. The word psychedelic was coined by a person at a particular time uh, in 1956 by this gentleman here, Dr. Humphrey, Dr. Humphrey Osmond from, uh, from England. Uh, he was one of the first people who was doing uh, clinical research with psychedelics. I, I believe it was LSD. And he coined this 
this term before there, there were many other terms that were being devised or created by people who were working with these things. Um, but it, this one kind of stuck because the word itself is made up of these two, uh, these two words, uh, psyche and delane, uh, which means either mind or soul manifesting. And the intent here then is that once you imbibe uh, a particular chemical or a particular plant, uh, that something about your mind rises up from inside you and it is therefore more manifest than it had been before. Uh, so that is the term psychedelic and it means this definition down here, any psycho absent, uh, psychoactive substance when consumed, which causes these changes in our perception, which might even cause visual hallucinations, but not all of the time, meaning that there is something that you are seeing with your eyes, uh, perceiving in your visual field uh, that might not necessarily be there unless you had taken this substance. And you might have a uh, altered sense of your body, meaning my, my nose is as large as the house um, or my mind, for example, um, I am going crazy or I feel like I am uh, I am the savior. You know, I am the savior of humanity for six hours or so. Um, so that is what psychedelic intends. Uh, but we know uh, from more recent research and usage that there is another term that is being used much more often, and that is entheogen. Entheogen was coined by uh, one of the most notable researchers and um, mycologists of the 20th century named R. Gordon Wasson. He was one of the first people to write about his experiences under the, um, under the effect of uh, these magic mushrooms that we'll talk a little bit about later. He and his wife actually traveled to, uh, to Mexico to try to find the famed curandera medicine woman named Maria Sabina. And he and his wife sat in one of her shaman circles um, and they had, been, uh, they had been mycological enthusiasts for years and had heard that there were these varieties of mushrooms that could actually give you these um, hallucinatory, deeply spiritual experiences. Um, and then what he found was her and these mushrooms. Um, and he coined this term uh, entheogen, coming from these two words, entheos and genestai, meaning that not only is it uh, different from psychedelic where it is manifesting something about your mind, but there is a holy sacred dimension to these things, not merely just on the level of, of psychology or consciousness, but you're actually manifesting the divine, entheos, the divine within, that there is a divine nature, there is a godly quality that can be revealed or uncovered by taking these things, uh, taking these plants. And he says in one of his papers, only those vision producing drugs that can be shown to have figured in shamanic or religious rites would be design designated entheogens. So probably LSD, which was created in a laboratory uh, in the 40s in Basel, Switzerland, maybe uh, Wasson would not have considered an entheogen because it did not have this shamanic uh, medicine history um, if, of indigenous people but uh, that might be debated today. This is all to say that when we talk about entheogens, or at least when I talk about entheogens, this is not merely uh, a drug that one would go to a party or go to the woods and have a really great time or maybe a terrible time, but this is part of an uncovering of uh, some holy aspect of the world or ourselves, our relationship with the divine, and entering into a relationship then with this plant or chemical um, to kind of further that, to go somewhere, to get somewhere in someone's spiritual or religious journey or development. Now, what is a mystical experience? People talk about religiosity, spirituality, and mysticism, and we don't always have some shared terms about what that means. So I wanted to share this definition of uh, what a mystical experience is. This is William James. He's one of the uh, first great scholars of religious phenomenology, meaning not just where does a religion come from or 
where does a religious text or practice come from, but what is happening when people who claim to have part of a religious tradition, what is happening in that community, in, that, in the mind of the practitioner and the phenomenon of being a religious person. Um, and he published one of the, still one of the hallmark texts of, of this scholarship, Varieties of Religious Experience in 1902, where he, uh, he himself had been experimenting with his own consciousness. He had been um, taking uh, laughing gas or, um, I forget what you call it. He'd been, you know, taking. Um, he had been inhaling this nitrous oxide, and um, he had noticed that there was something different about his his consciousness when inhaling nitrous um, than when he was just he was not taking it. And he wrote it this way: Our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness. Whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens. There lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. So he was able to tell that he entered into a different type of uh, a different way of being um, than he was when he was just waking up in the morning, having breakfast, teaching his university classes, or doing his writing. When he took uh, something from outside himself, a, a psychedelic or an entheogen, here just uh, just nitrous gas. Um, and that there was something unique about uh, this, this mind consciousness, this altered state um, that was different. And he would say they're not just two, not just altered and non-altered, but he would say there are many ways that our consciousness um, exists in our lives. Um, and we usually just only talk about the one when, we're, um, when, our, when, our, when, our, when we are in our waking state. And so he wanted to understand what religion and spirituality meant with regard to consciousness. So this is what I mean, that there is uh, a special type of consciousness um, that we will not totally get into immediately, but a, a little bit later about what is, um, what is an expanded state of consciousness when talking about psychedelics or entheogens. But just to know, mystical means beyond our normal waking consciousness. Some of the hallmarks of mystical awareness or consciousness um, that might make it different from our waking state um, are a, a number of them. And this, these are just a, a couple of them, but uh, there probably are many more. And according to different traditions or, or lineages or practices, there might be many, um, but these are some of the most common ones. And these are some of the most common that came up at, when I was at Johns Hopkins, I took a very long battery um, of, of questionnaires after the fact. Um, and they wanted to know something about my mystical uh, awareness. And they asked me many questions about these hallmarks. Did I have this kind of experience? Was it this kind of experience? And these were the ones that they focused mainly on. They are unity, meaning that Either the divinity that I experienced, if I experienced divinity at all, was unified in some way, right? It wasn't multiple entities and personalities, but there was some unified field around the sense that I felt that I was making contact with that divine presence. Uh, or that I and the universe and all things and all people were also unified in some special way, more than just an idea or a concept or a value. Yes, we're all, we're all one. We're all one nation or we're all one people, but to feel it as deeply as possible as if it was a truth that was indubitable, that was inalienable to my life, um, something that I could not shake and I felt in the deepest place in myself. Um, so that is unity. The other, the next is transcendence of space and time wasn't that it, I knew it was Tuesday, I knew that it was uh, probably around 3 p.m., but I had kind of left the, uh, the field of there being a concept of time, that I was on a couch in Johns Hopkins, but I felt as though I was nowhere and everywhere at the same time. I was beyond the strictures of how I usually run my day. I'm here at this time, I'm here in this place, I am here and far beyond, I am now and in the past and in the future. Something called intuitive knowledge, or as um, our, our, our dear friend William James would call the noetic quality. 
were there ideas? Were there um, things that I was perceiving or learning or coming to understand through my experience that then were so intuitive, it was as if they were just truths that I could not run from, facts that I could not hide from, um, something about my relationship with myself, or relationship with my body or my parents, my workplace, my spouse, my child, um, something about um, my religious tradition, a, a truth in the universe that was out there that I felt as if it, if it had come from me and that no one had to tell me. It's just something that came to me, uh, uh, maybe just from the beyond, but it was as if I had had the thought myself. So no etic, no esis, this kind of knowledge. Um, the sacredness, it wasn't that it was like kind of cool, it was interesting, um, but that I felt as if I was in a holy place, a holy space, that the experience that I was, happen that I was having had the dimension of not being um, secular or uh, I would say um, mundane, but something beyond this realm. Um, think about that moment when everyone is, if you've had this experience, um, on Yom Kippur, right before the Chazan or the Chazanit, the cantor is standing before or within the congregation, um, and there is this deep feeling of, of trembling or togetherness or specialness beyond special. Uh, that is the degree of sacredness that uh, these, these experiences can afford a person. Also a deeply felt positive mood. Um, I would quibble with this one a little bit because um, I can say that I have had a non-positive mood, um, but in a deeply positive, a deeply felt positive mood um, that this is one of the most ecstatic, um, most wonderful things that can happen. An overwhelming sense of, of gratitude and excitement that it, that it is happening um, and that you are feeling it with every fiber of your body. And then finally, something about its ineffability, meaning that after the fact, or even during maybe, um, that it is very hard to capture with words, either spoken or in writing, about exactly what it is that I experienced when I was in that mystical state. Um, what happened at various points throughout the, the trip or the journey. Um, what is it that I could say that I saw or even that I say that I learned or intuited? It might be difficult to explain and that's why there is probably sometimes a gap whether it happens because you take a plant or you ingest a plant or a compound or you have a naturally occurring mystical uh, experience, something that just is generated endogenously from within you without anything external being taken. It's hard to then say to a friend, to a confidant, to um, a, a clergy member, to a parent, to a spouse, um, this is what it was like. Um, and many people, of course, they recount this, that even though it was beyond real, it was beyond true, they still cannot find the right words to capture what it is that they saw or they felt. And that sometimes then makes talking about mysticism um, potentially a little bit um, embarrassing because then um, you're, stammering, you, you can't capture it, but you feel it intensely and deeply, it might be more easy to, um, to keep it to oneself. So these are some of these hallmarks of mystical awareness, at least for James and, and certainly for Johns Hopkins amongst uh, other research facilities who are doing this kind of work, where they wanna know uh, from one to 10, how was this a, uh, an experience of unity? From one to 10, how much did you feel like you were in a sacred space? Um, and I can, I'll talk a little bit about where did this research come from? Uh, you know, most people probably have heard about psychedelics. They've probably heard about entheogens and have some idea about what plants and substances we're talking about. Uh, but I think that very few people that I encounter when talking about this know a little bit about the history of uh, the research that was done uh, in the 60s and 70s. So it started with two people, probably more, but at least two at Harvard. And those were and, uh, Dr. Timothy Leary, you know, the gentleman, the very handsome gentleman on the left, and Richard Alpert, 
also a, a nice looking guy uh, on the right. Um, he later on, uh, he became Richard Alpert became known as Ramdas, the spiritual teacher. And uh, these two people had uh, encountered these magic mushrooms because of our Gordon Wasson, uh, the person that we talked about who coined the term entheogen. And Timothy Leary was so overtaken by the power of uh, this plant, this mushroom, uh, rather, this fungus, that he said that what he experienced in just an hour under the influence of this fungus was more than he had ever experienced in years and years and years of psychotherapy. So he thought that the power and the potential for psilocybin was so great and its impact on psychotherapy, they were, they were both in the behavioral sciences department and psychotherapy departments in Harvard, that they decided that they would actually create something called the Harvard Psilocybin Project, where they would run a number of studies by giving grad students and volunteers uh, psilocybin under controlled uh, settings, in controlled settings, uh, them as therapists, and uh, to then study the experiences and the effects that people had while they were in this controlled setting. One of the most famous studies uh, was carried out by um, one of their research assistants named Walter Pankey. And Walter Pankey, it, so it is said, although now we know that um, it might be in dispute, um, with Leary and with Alpert, they designed something called the Marsh, Marsh Chapel or Good Friday Experiment where uh, they took 20 graduate divinity students, I, I believe all Christian, and I believe mostly, if not all male. And what they did is they gave half of the group uh, psilocybin, and they gave half of the group something else. I believe it could have been niacin, but uh, I might be wrong. And then to have them go on Good Friday, the Friday before Easter Sunday, into the Marsh Chapel on the Harvard campus. And they would have them be in the basement. So uh, above ground, the, the Good Friday service would be carried out uh, in the chapel and the music and the sermon would be piped down in speakers for these 20 people in the basement in pews. And it, it <laughs> can you guess what happened? Half of the group had this overwhelming spiritual experience and half of the group felt a little tingly for a little bit. Um, so what they, it quickly became very clear that uh, the study design was, was very flawed, actually. It was not double blind because people who received the psilocybin probably knew that they were getting the psilocybin. People who got the other compound, I think it was niacin, uh, they knew that they were not doing whatever those other people were there when people were raising their hands and saying, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Um, so actually, if you want to look at an update of this, I think it was uh, 25 years later, Rick Doblin, who is the founder and CEO of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science, um, he looked at the, the conditions of this Good Friday experiment. He said what they got right and what they got wrong, um, but that most of the findings they're starting to, you know, they were looking at um, as basically being consistent uh, with the, what, they, what their goals were at least. So despite these design challenges, it inspired even more research and it completely opened up the field in a, in a brand new way. Um, not only um, because of some of the um, indiscretions of not only Timothy Leary, um, but also Richard Alpert, the Harvard Psilocybin uh, project had been had been closed down uh, and their funding was taken away. They were both fired from Harvard. Um, but uh, not even a decade later, Richard Nixon signed the Controlled Substance Act of, uh, Substances Act of 1971, making uh, all of these uh, drugs and all of these plants and fungi uh, illegal, uh, scheduled scheduled class one and had that meaning that the government had decided that they had no uh, beneficial purpose for human beings and they had uh, no benefit to scientific study. And that meant that it was uh, a felony to possess them, to, uh, to grow them and cultivate them. And you would then have one of the harshest penalties uh, because of your uh, possession or uh, cultivation of these 
of these things. And so all, because of this, uh, this act, um, many other countries followed in suit. The research here in this country, it continued in some places until the early 80s, uh, but that quickly dried up after that, after that around the, the early 80s or so, and all around the world mostly uh, until very recently. Until, I just wanna check on my time here. We're okay. Um, in 2008, um, Roland Griffiths, this gentleman here, one of the sweetest people you'll ever meet, he published a landmark paper. Uh, he was a lead researcher. He is a lead re researcher at Johns Hopkins University. And he uh, published this paper entitled Mystical Type Experiences Occasioned by Psilocybin Mediate the Attribution of Personal Meaning and Spiritual Significance 14 Months Later. What that means is that people who take high doses of psilocybin that are derived synthetically um, from magic mushrooms have experiences that are close to, if not completely um, the same as a natural mystical experience. And it's hard to tell the difference between someone who takes a mushroom and someone who has a natural mystical experience. Not only that, but they, they have this person who takes psilocybin thinks that feels that it is one of the most significant experiences of their entire lives. They don't have the, the numbers here, but I think it's roughly 80% of the people who had gone through the research that it took to publish this paper in 2008 said it was in their top five of most meaningful experiences of their entire life. And I believe 50% said that it was the number one greatest experience of their life. That, that's pretty significant to me. Um, and this has, this paper, this one paper, um, has been basically the foundation for all sorts of studies, long-term meditators, what are, what's happening in the minds of long-term meditators when they take psilocybin, people who have terminal cancer um, and their fear of death, people who are addicted to cigarettes, people who are experiencing OCD, people who are experiencing um, sexual trauma, uh, et cetera. All of these groups are being studied in an ongoing way um, with regard to how psilocybin might actually change their, their life and their situation because of this one or two powerful uh, experiences because of psilocybin. And then just to read the highlighted part here, the bold, the bold part, psilocybin occasion experiences similar to spontaneously occurring mystical experiences and which were evaluated by volunteers as having substantial and sustained personal meaning and spiritual significance. The ability to prospectively occasion mystical experiences should, should permit rigorous scientific investigations about their causes and consequences. Um, so much so that um, I was one of the first test subjects to not be studied for anything with regard to uh, a mental health state or an addiction. This, the study that I was in called the Religious Leaders um, Study um, was not about me having, God forbid, terminal cancer, not about necessarily me having um, some mental malady or, or issue with my mental health that uh, made it impossible for me to function as a parent or as a father or as an employee or as a leader in some way, but merely just to say, what is here? What is here for people who have this spiritual religious disposition and what can we then know about the, 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 the question, the hard question of consciousness uh, because of this? And what is the nature of mystical experience for people who have a vocabulary about the self and the soul in this particular way? So this was a little bit about my experience. Um, I had uh, a major uh, assessment program um, that I was part of, uh, many phone calls, many follow-ups. Uh, I went to Johns Hopkins. They now have dedicated an entire psychedelic research uh, unit um, after millions and millions of dollars of, of donations. Um, and philanthropic dollars. It's not just in the behavioral sciences department, it is its own thing. Um, these are some of my, my guides, the people who guided me through this process. They're 
healthcare workers, their social workers, their longtime psychedelics uh, researchers who've been in the field for a long time. And for about two years, I, I had gone to Johns Hopkins about four times to be part of this study. Um, I had been screened medically, psychologically, and personally. I was told that you know, I, I knew that if I had uh, had any sort of um, uh, family history with, with mental illness that I would not be a suitable match for this. Um, if I had had my own uh, issues with mental health or if I was, I was taking antidepressants or, or something like that, that I, I wouldn't be um, a good candidate for that because there, is, there are still risks. Um, they don't know exactly what the risks are. They're not willing to risk it in order to know what the risks are. Um, but there is enough circumstantial evidence to wonder that people who have bad trips or people who have very negative experiences, um, people continue to tell me, even when I point to very positive data about what this can do for people, uh, people in the 70s and 80s say like, well, yeah, my friend did this much acid and he never came back. Oh yeah, well, I had a sister who took mushrooms this many times and she's never been the same. So they understand that this might have a, a, a breaking effect, that there might be people who are predisposed um, to having some sort of mental, uh, mental health disorder. And this might just be the thing to push them into uh, a place where they weren't before. So because of all of these reasons, uh, it is not for everyone. And so not only now, but even in the future, whatever the advocacy and education work that there is to be done, it is not something that uh, should be just given out freely, at least I don't think, um, because of the negative impact that it might have on a number of people. So in total, I spent 104 weeks as a subject of this study. My set and my setting. My mindset, um, I had, uh, just uh, when I, at the time of my uh, my first session here at Johns Hopkins, um, we had uh, a we had just had a, a, a baby girl, um, and so I knew that after the birth of my daughter, that I would be traveling to uh, the East Coast to be with these very fine people in this very fine room. Um, you can see that. Uh, this is looks like someone's living room, but it really is a, a research facility. There are cameras in the ceilings. Uh, I believe that all of the sound is being recorded. Uh, there looks like there is a, a mushroom god on the left. There's a statue of the Buddha. There's a very comfortable couch. It's like I would love to get this couch for my house. So comfortable. Um, there's a very old stereo system that wonderful, beautiful music is being piped in um, into my ears. My eyes are covered. My guides are with me on the floor or they're in their chair um, and it is well appointed. It looks like an anthropologist uh, professor's living room basically. Um, and I was on the couch roughly for about seven to eight hours. Um, I was able to get up and go to the bathroom when I needed to. I was, if I ever felt any sort of sense of overwhelm or, you know, at one point I remember during my, my first session, um, I think I took off my earphones and I, I looked up to one of my guides and I said, is this forever? Like, is this what I do now? I'm here now and this is what it's like. And immediately someone came and took my hand and said, you're not going to be here forever. This is happening to you right now. You've taken a very powerful drug, um, but this will be over in a couple hours. So all you need to do is turn inward, let go and float down the river. Um, and so if there ever was a sense that, you know, there was a rising anxiety about what was actually happening to me inside my mind and my heart, uh, that there was always someone who was going to support me. But they were mostly just kind of backed off, took notes if I ever needed them to, I wanted to remind myself of something later. I said, you know, remind me that uh, I have to tell my wife that I, I love her or something. Um, so um, it was not like they were guiding me through some like meditation or, or guided imagery, um, but that they were there. They knew kind of the, the inner terrain. And I knew that if, if I needed anything, if I felt nervous or upset or scared, or I just needed someone to walk me to the bathroom because the walls were moving, um, 
then uh, they would be there for me. So whew, trip one, I won't talk uh, very much about my direct experiences because who wants to hear about you know, what it was like for someone else to take drugs? It's like um, you know, someone telling you about the dream that they had uh, the night before. Maybe you like that and we can talk about that another time, but um, the time is short and the task is great. So I will say that it was really typified by this kind of dynamic, overwhelming, uh, visual uh, pattern. Um, there was constant moving of light. It was always, it, it was always wonderful. It was always beautiful and powerful. It was awe inspiring and inducing. I, I felt great gratitude to God and you know, calling out again and again, thank you, thank you. Um, feeling as though I was moving through a, a tunnel, a canal at several points. I felt, you know, as if I was giving birth to my wife who was giving birth to my daughter and just you know, crying and, and feeling completely overwhelmed by love and joy and gratitude. Um, there was some Kabbalistics, there was some, there was some Jewish imagery there um, for me that I interpreted uh, it as having something to do with a, a particular life circumstance at that moment that I knew at that moment, that's what that noetic or intuitive knowledge was. What I was seeing and feeling had a direct impact or it was, it was teaching me something about a circumstance in my life that I knew that after I returned home that I had to do something about it because of the thing that I was witnessing. If I had not seen that, I would not make the decisions that I would need to because of that circumstance overwhelmingly positive, beautiful, life-affirming. Um, and I knew because the, it, was, it was such a great experience that the lead researcher said, okay, the next time you come back, you'll have more. Okay, so more must be better. <laughs> no, <laughs> more was not better. More was actually nothing. <laughs> um, I would think that more psilocybin, the you know, most powerful, um, pure grade, <laughs> nothing wrong with it. It was created in a laboratory um, that I would have had an even more exciting, even more exhilarating experience. But what I experienced for six to seven hours was basically just blackness and boredom. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to be uh, here on the couch forever in this dark hole. I felt very sad and depressed, like I had done something wrong or I had done something in my preparation that, uh, that did not give me access to you know, higher realms of, of knowledge or insight or uh, even you know, an audience with the divine in the same way that I had before. And uh, it left me shaken. It made me feel as, the, uh, feel as if I had been denied something, denied something very powerful. Um, and it, it left me uh, quite sad for a number of weeks after. Um, so, you know, even when I was done and I expressed this to the, the lead researchers and my guides, they, they really didn't understand why it would be that, but everything is possible. Um, so more does not mean better with psychedelics or anything. Turns out, maybe you probably knew that. I did not. Um, and so the phase that came afterward is the phase called integration. If I had preparation before going to Baltimore, exploration while I was at the time, uh, while I was on the couch, everything that happens after the fact is integration. And uh, according to the Zendo Harm Reduction Handbook, this is an organization um, that helps people at festivals, um, music festivals, dance festivals, for people who are having psychedelic experiences that they might have taken too much or God forbid they didn't know that they were taking something, someone had given them something. Um, or they're just having a hard time, they can go to these tents and there can be someone who is there guiding them um, and it's a safe place for them to be. They can, they feel safe, they feel taken care of. Um, and they say that integration is the phase within which an individual assimilates and incorporates an experience into their psyche, body, and life. Um, so two years later, this integration experience, I, I, I wrote it and uh, in a article you can find online uh, entitled, I was a rabbinic psychonaut, uh, where I said that my first session was a journey through the world of phenomena, light and color, relationships, emotion and apprehension, the world of imminence. 
My second session was a journey into transcendence beyond polarities and causality to a place as the writer Stanislav Graf describes pregnant with all existence. So what I was going through then was uh, the first one was complete presence, complete color, uh, complete obviousness of the, div of the divine uh, and my place in the world. The second, which was maybe even the higher revelation, was everything beyond that. No light, no color, no presence, only absence. Um, and there was not something to be, to regret or to lament, um, but taken together, I came to understand something about the nature of my own religious life is that there is presence and there is absence. And sometimes I prefer one over the other for obvious reasons. I want presence. I want to know that things are good. I want to know that things are, uh, are there, that I can count on them. But if, they're, if they aren't, that doesn't mean that I'm having less of an experience, that this is somehow a spiritual downgrade, um, but is just as potent with meaning um, if only I would see, um, if I would uncover um, something meaningful in it. Um, that it was not uh, absent of meaning, it was, the, it was waiting for me to ascribe meaning to it. Okay, so just a little bit of background about where I'm coming from, and I know that we only have 15 minutes for, okay, you talked about psychedelics and entheogens, what about the future of Judaism? So if you wanna stick around, we don't have to stop just because um, the, the time is going to be over. So hopefully this is interesting enough to you that you want to stick around for this and the questions. There's just a lot to talk about. We could talk about this for a long time. So here are two headlines from two different types of publications. Um, in Scientific America, January 2020, not too many months ago, MDMA or ecstasy shows promise as a PTSD treatment that currently in phase three um, uh, clinical trials, both in this country and in Israel, especially uh, for this chemical, this substance, um, MDMA, you might know as X or ecstasy or Molly, other names, um, that people who are PTSD patients, either because they are soldiers or because they have gone through um, painful traumas in, as children or as adults, um, sexual abuse, um, people who have experienced terrible suffering um, are starting to find that there is great relief that happens in this clinical environment when they take um, MDMA um, with this kind of preparation, exploration, and integration model. Uh, and now just last month, just last month as of today, what's today? What's, to, what's this month? Um, May 2020. Uh, and vice get ready for pharmaceutical grade magic mushroom pills. Um, so the thing that I experienced, uh, magic mushrooms in a pill, um, that we are getting ready for a, another psychedelic renaissance if we haven't been in it already, um, but that these things are going to be made more and more available to people who are looking for them, uh, not just to have a drug experience, but for people who are looking for some relief, uh, the psychopharmacological model uh, for so many people is not working. It has never worked for so many. For some, it does. Um, but people who have either had a lifelong depression, who have tried to use antidepressants, SSRIs, and have never found relief, people who don't find relief through talk therapy, uh, there might hold real promise for people. Um, and that might just be the first phase of this, to actually show that there is great benefit for humans who are experiencing suffering. And when people can understand that there is something of benefit, not only for scientific research, but for actual people um, in an ongoing way, that then it might open up to not people who are, are suffering from any immediate cause, but for people who are really just excited and interested in uh, self-exploration and transformation for the betterment of well people, as one person has said, uh, Robert Jesse, Bob Jesse. And so um, we are kind of on the precipice here uh, about what is happening and, and what is possible. And nevertheless, there's a stigma that exists for good reason. As I mentioned, 
um, for people who went through negative experiences. Certainly um, this uh, propaganda, this anti-drug campaign that swept through our country in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, I don't know about you, but I was a dare kid. Um, somebody, one of my uh, good friends had asked me like, what do you mean you had never done psychedelics until this point? The truth is, is that I was uh, completely, I, I completely believed um, my dare counselor uh, who, it was a police officer that would come to our class, I think once every two weeks or once every month. And he would tell us about just how bad drugs were. If you took MDMA, you'd get a hole in your head, your, you know, your brain would split open and your children have, would have birth defects forever. If you took L LSD, I didn't even know what magic mushrooms were. If you take LSD, you will go into a psychosis even just once and you might, um, you know, believe that you're a glass of orange juice and you'll spill over and uh, then you'll, you know, you'll basically be freaking out for the rest of your life. Or I think I remember kids used to say on the playground, you know, that if you take LSD five times, you're legally insane. And why would I not believe them? So uh, it was, it was so effective that I never wanted to take these things. Um, I did take some degree of uh, cannabis as a high school and a college student. Um, but psychedelics were not something that I would ever entertain because of this, this stigma. So what about for the future of Judaism? Well, I think that there are a number of things to talk about. And again, there's so much to say and so little time. Um, but for me, truly, this is first and foremost, um, what, is, what is to be beheld because of the research that is uh, coming out um, but also from the things that people are able to talk about anecdotally. And number one, I think on the agenda, if there is one, is that this is a call to rekindle our mystical heart. What does uh, that mean? Um, I love this quote from Leonard Cohen, who I think um, says it so precisely and succinctly, even though it looks like a long paragraph. Judaism is a secretion with which an Eastern tribe surrounded divine irritation, a direct confrontation with the absolute that happened once in history, and we still feel the warmth of that confrontation, divorced as we are from the terms of it. That happened long ago in the verses that we just read from at the beginning of this session. Today we covet the pearl, but we are unwilling to support the irritation, the burning nucleus, and our spiritual life today has the exact consistency of an unclean oyster and it stinks to heaven. We cannot face heaven. We have lost our genius for the vertical. Jewish novelists are sociologists, horizontalists, and the residue of energy from that great vertical seizure we had 4,000 years ago, that we turn toward ourselves. We knock on our own doors and wonder that no one answers. For many good historical reasons, uh, Western Judaism, specifically in Western Europe, uh, went on uh, through a thoroughgoing process of uh, rationalization, um, of uh, assimilation, acculturation, and because for the reform movement to uh, want to integrate its Jewish members into polite Western society, Western Christian society, that meant that all of that uh, exoteric mysticism that was, has been part of everyday Judaism for so long uh, was something that could not be tolerated. It was something that had to be relegated to the, to the waste basket of history um, if we were going to um, be like our good Protestant neighbors. And so um, the, the the practices of, of Hasidut and Kabbalah, the ideas about the imminence and the transcendence of God, uh, of God all at once, uh, the practices which could help us become more in contact more of the time through our religious uh, practices, through our, our spiritual work, um, was something that was, was not talked about and not dealt with and was then kind of left for um, people who then were going to then identify as Orthodox later. Um, and so the, the, reform, the reform revolution was that of kind of this, um, this uh, what do I want to say, <laughs> um, was this thoroughgoing 
uh, removal of, of mysticism from, from Jewish life. And so that is what he talks about here, Leonard Cohen, is that we can feel the warmth of that moment, uh, but we don't want anything to do with it. Rather, um, we turn our focus inward and not how we can become more in contact with that sense of unity, that sense of that positive feeling, um, of the sense of terror and awe that might be part of uh, the divine encounter, um, but it is something about community, or it's something about being a good person, or doing good deeds, um, and not necessarily um, about having an overwhelming spiritual experience because of uh, the work that we do inside and outside of the synagogue. So not only do we need to come back in touch with the texts, the modes of practice, um, to begin experimenting again um, with these concepts and ideas, not only um, in Jewish renewal or in Hasidism or um, in the Haredi community, not only for the communities who have never let go of these traditions, uh, Jews from Yemen, from, um, from Eastern lands, from uh, Arab lands, uh, but all Jews need to get to know their spiritual heritage. Um, what that means is then we also need to be preparing Jewish guides for not only for these psychedelic experiences when they come, become more commonplace, but for when we can explore these mystical states of consciousness, even without the use of drugs. There are breathing techniques, meditation techniques, um, rhythm and, and body movement te techniques that can bring us to these places. But we have to know, first of all, what we need to do to prepare, what it is like when we actually get there, and then how we bring these experiences, drugs or otherwise, into our waking consciousness. Um, so Reb Zalman Shafter Shalomi, who was far beyond most people, um, most religious leaders, Jewish leaders even today, he saw this in uh, 1964 after he had taken his first hit of LSD with Timothy Leary. Um, and writing about his experience on that day at the very end of um, his write-up of this uh, entitled the Aliyat HaNeshama, Aliyat HaNeshama and the LSD Experience. He said, we need to train Jewish spiritual directors in the LSD experience, put our text to use. What I would want to do if I had the opportunity again is to control it in the shtibel, the prayer setting space, with more of a, of a Jewish paraphernalia, music, pictures, space arrangement. But I, I would also want to have someone who is going to be the ground control to keep on call, to, excuse me, to keep on calling attention to some Jewish program because LSD took a hold of me and I had nothing to do with it, right? He kind of kind of forgot what he had done, all of this preparation. And then as soon as the LSD hit, um, he says that he kind of forgot about what he was doing. Although if you read his trip report, he's having a deeply Jewish experience, a deeply profound Hasidic experience because he can't escape who he is um, coming from Chabad as he did. So um, he would want to make a sacrament out of it to be administered as it were in shul under given situations with certain things. Um, next March, I hope to become the first rabbinic psychedelic assisted therapy um, therapist. Um, I'm going to be attending the California Institute for Integral Studies in San Francisco, California, and be doing a year long training program um, where I'm going to be learning about how to be a guide in the settings that Reb Zalman is talking about and the settings that I, I found myself in, um, and to be doing exactly what Reb Zalman hoped for. Um, to eventually, when these therapies become available to more people and people who want to make it a particularly Jewish experience, whether they're Jewish or otherwise, um, to then have the training in these modalities and then to create a Jewish environment uh, of preparation, looking at some of our most profound Jewish texts that talk about the mystical experience, the being in touch with the beyond, um, what it's like to explore in, in a Jewish context, and then how do we integrate Jewishly? Um, how do we make uh, Jewish decisions because of these psychedelic experiences that we have? Um, there is so much to talk about, as I keep saying, uh, and I really do wanna make sure that I have time for um, what people wanna ask, and I know it's, we're getting to nine. So I really just wanna say this as well. Um, 
that these things, as I have mentioned in the clinical model, they do have the power to help us heal our deepest wounds. These substances I have mentioned in indigenous uh, and native cultures were primarily used for healing. Um, we're seeing so much about PTSD and depression, either MDMA and psilocybin. And so for uh, a people who have been profoundly impacted by trauma, by violence, um, by suffering throughout thousands of years that is passed through our DNA, DNA that is passed through our genetics, um, what could then this be, what potential might this have for generational trauma um, and the relief of generational trauma for the Jewish people. You know, there's one famous example of this. Um, this is, uh, these are pictures of um, uh, a person that we call now uh, Katzetenik, um, for Yechiel de Nur. Um, he was in Auschwitz. He had suffered at the hands of the Nazis. And this is him at the Eichmann trial, um, who, and he is uh, testifying about the experiences that I had. And it was one of the most profound testimonies um, because he was able to go into such detail about the role of Eichmann in Auschwitz. Um, and the person that helped him overcome um, all of the pain and the fear and the suffering was this person here in the middle, um, this uh, Dutch professor of psychology and a psychiatrist, uh, Jan Bastians, who was using LSD in treatment. You can see here, um, he's holding up this, um, this book about the SS and about uh, the death camps, the German death camps. And he was specifically helping people who had gone through the Holocaust um, and wanted to then see that there was a, the possibility for healing people um, because this was helping them get into the conscious and, and, and uh, unconscious and subconscious levels of their psyches to help them healing with the things that they had repressed because of uh, just how powerfully painful they had been. Um, you can read about it. I won't read here inside, but there, there is a uh, accounting of um, Denur's experiences both uh, uh, in Auschwitz, but also um, because of his treatment with LSD in this book, Shiviti, A Vision. I highly recommend that you, um, you read it to know more. Um, but this is all to say that I, I do believe not only can this help us rekindle the mystical heart uh, of our religion, get us to know deeper about our spiritual heritage, to heal our deepest wounds, um, but maybe, just maybe, um, something closer to what the Baal Shem Tov, um, the, the founder of Hasidism said, um, would be the redemption of the world. And this is um, in his own Aliyat HaNeshama, in his own soul ascension, he said um, that he visited the Messiah in the Messiah's palace. And he asked the Messiah, he said, when will the master, meaning you, the Mashiach, uh, come? And he answered, by this you shall know. In the time when your teaching, you, the Baal Shem Tov, will become public and revealed in the world, and your wellsprings will burst forth to the farthest extremes, that which I have taught you and you have comprehended, and they also shall be able to perform unifications and elevations as you. And then all of the klipot, all of those outer husks, the things that we don't find um, to be bringing us closer to connection and spirituality, but the things that we think are drawing um, our power and bringing us farther away to our own um, most held beliefs and deep goals, they will cease to exist. And there shall be a time of goodwill and salvation. Um, so if we can all ascend to the level of the Baal Shem Tov, um, maybe potentially by means of these substances, these plants and fungi. Um, if we can become uh, this God aware, this uh, divinely intoxicated, um, and to become like the Baal Shem Tov, perhaps there can be uh, redemption, not just of the Jewish people, but all people um, by coming closer um, to the divine that is within each and every one of us um, and acknowledging the divine in others as well.